give rise to the subjective experience of the conscious mind experiencing the world. As this philosopher, David Chalmers, later wrote, we know consciousness far more intimately than we know the rest of the world, but we understand the rest of the world far better than we understand consciousness. In his play, The Hard Problem, Tom Stafford expands Chalmers' question to such matters as why something like meaning or morality exists, what might be called even harder hard problems. The play The Hard Problem follows the fortunes of Hillary, a young psychologist working at the fictitious Kroll Institute for Brain Science, where she attempts to find scientific evidence to disprove theories such as those believed by her sometimes lover, a materialist psychologist named Spike, who believes, who believes that competition is the natural order of things, that altruism is always self-interest, and that the mind is nothing more than a computational result of three pounds of gray matter wired up like the London Underground with 86 billion stations and 300 trillion connections hardwired for me first. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Elizabeth Camp. Liz is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Gives me time to remember to switch pages. <laughs> she received her PhD at Berkeley and then spent three years with the Harvard Society of Fellows. She spent seven years teaching at the University of Pennsylvania before accepting her current appointment at Rutgers. David Chalmers is professor of philosophy at New York University and the Australian National University. As I mentioned before, he coined the expression the hard problem, which he then expanded in his book, The Conscious Mind in Search of a Fundamental Theory, and in other writings. And finally, something I've always wanted to say, uh, a man who needs no introduction, <laughs> but one of the most important writers, uh, playwrights in the English language today, Tom Stoppard. At the end of the conversation, we will open the floor for a short question and answer period in order that everyone here and online can hear all of the questions. We are going to ask you to queue up at one of those microphones in the aisles there, uh, rather than force Liz and everyone to try and catch hands waving around in this thing. But with that, I will now hand this microphone off to Elizabeth Camp. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as Walter said, we're discussing the hard problem, uh, both in the form of Tom's n new play and in the form of, uh, you know, the larger, the hard problem itself, with quotation marks and without quotation marks. So I thought a way of uh, starting would be just to ask, what is the hard problem supposed to be? Um, and uh, what makes it especially hard? Uh, do you think, I mean, there are hard problems, there's rocket science, right? There's, uh, you know, um, people say, it's, you know, it isn't really hard. Uh, so what makes a hard problem, a hard problem, what makes it attractive to you as someone, as something worth exploring in this kind of format? Um, all right, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna sort of begin by derailing, but it just seemed to me that, that we should take the phrase uh, as being a phrase in, philosophy and also a phrase in theatre. Mm -hmm. And it would actually help me if, if it is okay with you guys that if, if David actually told us what it meant yeah. in his world, yeah. and then I'll explain why my play has that Great. title. Is that okay with you? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the hard problem, as I understand it, is the problem of how do objective physical processes in the brain give rise to the subjective experience of the mind and the world. So neuroscience is telling us a lot, 
about the brain, and to a very first approximation that suggesting that we're very, very, the brain is a very complicated computer, which gets certain inputs, processes them, processes them with its 100 billion neurons, calculates, decides, and then issues in some output. And when it comes to the science of behavior, which is what a lot of neuroscience has been doing, it's getting quite successful. But that's all still objective and, in a way, mechanical. But we all know that there's more than behavior to the human being, and there's more than just processes. There's consciousness. There's what it's like from the inside. Right now, I'm sitting here on this stage with visual um, experience of, of the two of you and an audience. Here, hearing my own voice, feeling my own body, the heat of these lights. This all adds up to a kind of a giant movie playing in my me mind. memories. Yeah, a little bit of nerves of sitting here talking about, <laughs> talking on this <laughs> stage with Tom Stoffard of all people. But uh, this is all part of this big subjective inner movie. And the question is, why is there subjectivity at all? Why, why aren't I just a giant computer going on processing and behaving, but in the dark, as it were, without any? subjective experience. And right now, you know, as far as I can tell, nobody in neuroscience or the sciences has any kind of a conclusive theory of why this thing, consciousness, should exist at all. So this is a focus on, so your focus is actually on um, phenomenal consciousness or uh, experience, right? Your characters grapple with that and with a whole host of other sort of related questions. I came uh, upon the phrase uh, through David uh, indirectly because the phrase then, like a Jacob's Ladder, tickled down the years and I was catching up late as usual to some of this. Um, and um, <clears throat> and I, I will fulfill my part of this bargain we made, but can I just ask you one more thing? <laughs> <laughs> from it. Uh, why wasn't it? Why wasn't it a problem until so recently? First thing that should be said is it's been a problem for a long time. It's been a hard problem for a long time before I ever called it the hard problem. So I'll take the credit for a catchy name. I can't take the credit for uh, for discovering the problem. It's true though that it's, the history is really, in some ways, surprisingly recent. I mean, it's rather hard to find this problem in the ancient Greeks. Um, most problems in philosophy you can find in the ancient Greeks, why not? The problem of consciousness. But René Descartes in the, uh, the 17th century had a version of the problem. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz in the, uh, the 18th century had started you know, really gesturing towards the problem of how is it that these objective processes, he talked about the mill, the brain looks like a, it could be like a windmill. Mm -hmm. uh, where in this windmill do you find the mind? It's probably not until the 19th century though that uh, People like uh, Thomas Huxley really come up with, um, Thomas Huxley says, the problem of how the brain should produce consciousness, it's as mysterious as how the djinn appeared when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful statement yes. of the problem. And I wouldn't claim to have advanced on that one. Um, thank you. I mean, I, I do take the strands going back to antiquity. Um, and, and yet the, the, the burden of my curiosity or, or my puzzlement was actually that it seemed to be a, a curiously neglected area when it became something that you got deeply interested in. It, uh, there was, wasn't there a famous anecdote about somebody being said, yeah, you can get interested in consciousness, but get tenure first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that, that, uh, aphorism originated around about the time that you got really interested in this. So, um, <laughs> so my question wasn't entirely a red herring. Uh, my play is about somebody who doesn't know the phrase, the hard problem, until somebody explains it to her on page, you know, 12 or something. Um, but she does have a problem uh, which I'll try and explain briefly, and then perhaps we can see why uh, uh, the three of us uh, can participate in this Venn diagram with this phrase on it, you know. Um, 
essentially, uh, she's somebody who is disturbed, I mean worried, uh, unhappy, uh, frustrated, by a sense that the um, normal attempts to explain the difference between right and wrong and the foundation of moral laws and so forth, she's uh, frustrated by the fact that these explanations seem to her to be incomplete. Uh, that uh, you don't actually um, have a sense that there is a truly objective, objective criterion for right and wrong, unless it's true for those people who believe in God. Um, she has an emotional reason in the play for saying her prayers, and and colleague in a rather puzzled way says, do you believe in God? And, and, and she says, well, I have to, because she's made an arrangement with herself. Uh, and what um, I guess, I have to say, just as just a parenthesis, um, you, you have no idea how thrilled I was to be told that David Chalmers is going to show up here and <laughs> how utterly terrified I was when I was told that he and I would be on the same stage talking as though we were equals. Um, if we were talking about dramaturgy, I'd probably do fine, but uh, in philosophy and or every possible branch of science, uh, I'm, I'm going cautiously. And it's a good moment to ask as as you're a ph philosopher, aren't you? You're flanked. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is philosophy uh, so deeply occupied with scientific explanations? <laughs> Should we swap places? <laughs> yes. Not yet. <laughs> well, am I... You is, is my, you've made a bargain first, and now you've got to... No, I'll talk about the play. Yeah. So, um, Is my premise wrong? I think that as, I don't know how this has happened, but um, I think that as a general characterization of, I mean, so um, I think a lot of Dave's work, um, a lot of my own work, lots of philosophers' work, um, takes, in a way, takes some, as its model something like a scientific kind of, mode of explanation or mode, but it's not, philosophy, philosophy is not the same as science. Um, and so there are, yeah, there are ways in which we have a freedom and uh, precisely are defined in contrast to scientific explanation. It's worth, it's worth noting that a whole lot of, almost all of science in fact, started as philosophy. Yeah. Isaac Newton called himself a natural philosopher. Yeah. And then what gradually happens over time is bits of philosophy get carved out in to become their own sciences. Roughly, once people come up with a methodology for studying them that makes them rigorous enough that you can get results that people agree about. Right. So what's left are the really hard questions that people are still disagreeing about after all these centuries. Oh. And hence the problem of consciousness is right now sitting right at that uneasy boundary between philosophy and science, but some people think we're now bringing it under control scientifically and other people are thinking, no, maybe it's still on this side of the, of the fence. Let me I add two things to that. One is psychology is one of the later of those sort of peelings off, yes. um, if for precisely for this reason. Um, and as you said, consciousness is sort of at the verge of being peeled off. People, there are neuroscientists and other psychologists and cognitive scientists who study and take seriously the question of uh, con phenomenal consciousness. Uh, but the other, some of these other questions that your characters are grappling with, that uh, the main character in particular is concerned with, are still more proprietary to philosophy. Um, free will, uh, yeah. morality. Morality, um, certainly. Uh, Spirituality and faith. Well, so I'm in God. this. Yeah, God. Um, I, I'm in this um, odd kind of two step maneuver, uh, speaking on behalf of my heroine, 
um, who is in a psychology department uh, in the play. Um, the two-step thing is this, that um, in the first place, uh, she believes that uh, the notion of morality itself, the, idea, the, concept, the concept of morality, the concept of good and the opposite and so on, is unintelligible without consciousness in the first place. And the second place, um, the, the pursuit of trying to explain consciousness had resolved into the study of correlations between brain activity and behavior, as though as one could map brain activity on a finer and finer scale every, on every instance, um, both in the sense of moment-to-moment -moment instances or general behavior patterns, that they could be related to something visible, uh, well, sometimes actually visible, but certainly ascertainable through electrodes. Um, and this pursuit, uh, you can correct me, I think it hit the buffers. Uh, it sort of, to change the metaphor, it sort of ran into the sands. And I haven't done really good homework for you, David, uh, but I think that you're kind of conceding that latterly by saying that what is really needed now is a radical new idea. Um, and perhaps, perhaps you've got a couple you could mention. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that psychology actually got started in the mid-19th century as a science of consciousness. And they were finding correlations not between the brain and behavior, but between you know, physical processes inside and outside the brain and states of consciousness. And a lot of this was done through introspection. Then early in the, uh, the 20th century, people came along, the behaviorist movement got started, and they basically took the attitude that all this introspection, all this consciousness was too subjective. Conscious science has to be objective. Consciousness is subjective, so science doesn't really have, move, have room for consciousness. And they turned psychology for a long time into the science of behavior. But then, uh, so just, it was really just a, one thing that did happen around fairly recently around the 1990s, with psychologists and neuroscientists, scientists, finally started to really take consciousness seriously as a topic again. I mean, philosophers had been interested in it all the time, but at least sometimes in the background, sometimes in the foreground, but suddenly, sometime in the 1990s, people thought, okay, we're ready for, uh, for consciousness again. At least a few people did. I mean, one shouldn't overstate it. Most neuroscientists are still connecting brain processes and behavior and only willing to speculate uh, about consciousness after many drinks late at night in the bar. <laughs> but, uh, but it is happening, and people are beginning to, uh, to talk about it now, and they're all coming together. But I think one thing we are recognizing is that to actually, well, it turns out, actually, you can have a conservative science of consciousness if you're willing to leave it at the level of correlations. Right. This brain process, this state of consciousness, and that's actually a lot of what's going on in the science right now. They say, um, for now, it's just going to be brain, pain, brain, uh, this brain area, this kind of experience of color, this brain area, this experience of happiness. But eventually we want more than correlations, we want explanation. Mm -hmm. we want to, how on earth could you explain why there is pain and happiness mm -hmm. and experience of color and all of, that, all of that in the first place? And that's really where the crazy ideas start to come in. There's a point in your, in your play where the characters just enumerate these and dismiss these and quick fire, one at a time. Panpsychism, everything is conscious. Uh, consciousness is quantum mechanical. Uh, consciousness is like a, consciousness is functional and even a thermostat is conscious and I'm missing one. And then they say all of these ideas are, are mm -hmm. crazy and I think one thing we're learning though is you need. But, but in fact, how crazy are they? <laughs> I, well, you know, my standards for craziness have gradually evolved over time, I think. <laughs> Face it, people, we live in a crazy world. <laughs> The world is weird. Quantum mechanics tells us the world is very weird, so I'm prepared to tolerate some pretty weird hypotheses. For example, 
that consciousness is present at a fundamental level of nature, like space and time and mass. Is, um, as far as radical ideas go, is, is God too radical for you? As yeah, a... so this is when, you're, when your character writes a paper called, Is God the Last Man Standing? Right? So, yeah. well, and I think her reasoning is, well, okay, the probability of God, the God hypothesis is not terribly high, but it's no lower than all these other hypotheses, so therefore it's psychologically equivalent. We might as well consider God. I mean, I might have some philosophical issues with the argument that <laughs> she makes right there. Can I, can I interject one? Yeah. So one thing that you might say, I don't know, is so there's crazy and then there's crazy, or there's, um, there's unexpected or radical and there's non-scientific. Um, so what, and I feel like some people would say panpsychism, We'd prefer not, but if we've got to go there, we're going to go there. Um, multiverses, you know, wouldn't have thought it, but if that's going to help, I guess we'll go there. Um, God, that's a different kind of, that's an ultimately non-scientific uh, explanation. It's a supernatural so, explanation. Right, and therefore, in some sense, spooky in a way that panpsychism understood as, you know, consciousness at a fundamental level might not be. I wonder if, I was curious about both of you, what you would think about, you know, is there a difference there between some, is mere radicalness all that it makes the difference or is there, are there some constraints, some kinds of explanation which allow something to be still a scientific explanation even if it's, you know, wild and unexpected and, uh, you know. Okay, can I just, can I just very briefly come to the, def to the defense of my um, sort of stalking horse character? Basically, what was being said was that an idea like um, consciousness being universal, so that every molecule is in some sense potentially conscious, uh, and that is true of not merely sunflowers, but ashtrays, chairs, bacteria. I mean, literally, the universe was, as it were, conscious um, and what she, and what she, what she's saying is that there are people who espouse this and they take it seriously um, but it actually is undemonstrable and that's an absolute you know the existence of God is undemonstrable so what, what she's saying is that to espouse either requires precisely an equivalent psychological embrace, if you like, or acceptance. I don't think that's, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a disreputable proposition. Maybe there's a small mm. disanalogy here. It's true that consciousness in other people is, as you say, undemonstrable. I can't prove that you're conscious mm. or that Liz is conscious or that anybody else here is conscious, because mm. all I can see from the outside is your behavior. Um, it could be that all that is mere behavior and you're just a hollow shell mm -hmm. on the inside. But I know that I'm conscious. That's the one thing that I'm certain of. Yes. As Descartes said, you know, I think, yeah. therefore I am. I'm conscious. I know that's the one thing I'm certain of, and therefore I'm certain of my own existence. So we know that consciousness, the phenomenon, exists. Yes. At least in at least one case, and needs an <laughs> explanation. <laughs> my case for me, and I presume your case for you, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, God, on the other hand, is, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a hypothesis. Yes. That people bring in to explain various things in the world, and I can ask the question, well, what really does it explain? And, you know, maybe there are, there are various things that people out there think that God might explain, but does God really help in explaining consciousness? Well, God would have to be conscious, I presume, in the first place. So it just kind of, for me, at least in this domain, God just kind of pushes the question back, and bringing God in doesn't actually help. Whereas it turns out, the hypothesis there's consciousness at the fundamental level of the universe, although, as you say, unprovable, is one which might actually help us in explaining the phenomenon by coming up with a set of mm -hmm. scientific laws, the fundamental laws of consciousness, mm -hmm. which might then help explain why it exists in me and you and Liz. So that's really the, uh, the to me, the, I mean, the scientist standard is one of something like you know, proof or falsification or demonstrability. For a philosopher, it's a looser standard. It's something like, does this help in explaining the phenomenon. Maybe your character could convince me that God helps in explaining the phenomenon, but I'm not convinced yet. Are you convinced that 
the effort must be made that consciousness demands explanation. Um, it might be a brute fact in nature, which in fact has no, that, that, that it doesn't consist of other facts which you can, as it were, prize apart. It just is like gravity or something. There are brute facts in nature and standard scientific theories take space time, space and time and mass as fundamental properties of the world. Mm -hmm. They don't try and explain in terms of anything more basic. But then they don't give up and say we can't theorize about them. Mm -hmm. Of course they come up with wonderful theories of these things in terms of the fundamental laws that govern them. The laws of gravity or quantum mechanics or the unified mm -hmm. theory that will unify all of these things. Mm -hmm. So actually my attitude to consciousness is very much like the scientist's attitude towards space. I think that it is in some sense a brute fact. One of the basic constituents yeah. of nature, not to be reduced to anything more basic. But I would like to think we can still have a science of it, find the fundamental laws that govern consciousness and connect it to everything else. I mean, physicists like to say we want to come up with fundamental laws in physics so simple you could write them on the front of a t-shirt. Mm. Well, I'd like to come up with the fundamental laws of consciousness so simple we could write them on the front of a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Consciousness is a warm puppy, you mean? <laughs> so let me use that to, um, so you are mostly focused on, you know, this blue and pain, right? Another kind of consciousness, another a other aspects of consciousness that um, uh, are, well, include uh, feelings of hope, um, and that your characters sometimes sort of, you know, grapple with and wonder how, how easily explained they are, feelings of sorrow or hope, um, emotionally tinged uh, 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 feelings, and these seem like they're more on the way toward explaining moral response, uh, they're more engaged with moral response, maybe they have something more to do with sensitivity to moral reality. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, you know. The, for, for so it's, if it's really a warm puppy, right? Um, uh, yeah, but the thing is, just want to—it's all part of the same spaghetti, I know. But just before that strand gets forgotten, um, what is sort of disappointing um, in a Darwinian? the conception of a Darwin, Darwinian evolution of moral rules. What is disappointing in that for Hillary in the play um, is that that is not really an objective. There's no Archimedean place to stand like Archimedes levering the earth. There's nowhere to stand where you can actually be outside this in order to define it. It's just something that biology gives you as a legacy of some kind. Um, and what she's basically saying is that um, unless there is an overall moral intelligence of some nature, um, then we are grading our own homework. Uh, we're giving ourselves our grade morally. Um, and I can completely sympathize with somebody who would like to believe that her choice of behavior, when she chooses between what she conceives to be good behavior and contrarywise, I completely sympathize with somebody who would like some, as it were, authentication of that choice. And you, David, maybe, I don't know, maybe you would say, well, obviously that's why God had to be invented. You've just explained why the invention had to emerge um, as a kind of, yeah, as an emergent phenomenon from this sense of incompletion. Uh, I feel really uh, 
So I'm slightly ashamed of myself for shoving this poor woman in front of me, saying, it's all, it's all, this is all about Hillary. But of course, I can't actually write her without having a severe degree of empathy. Um, so, so, so let me ask um, both of you, just as a way of sort of pushing a little bit harder on that. So do you think that you could have a creature, uh, somebody, a non-zombie, somebody, a, a, a being who experiences red and, uh, you know, yellow and um, pain even, but is morally inert. So it has... So this is interesting. I mean, it does seem to me there are these two animating ideas in Tom's play, really the problem of consciousness and the problem of morality. And in both cases, you want to be pointing at some limitations of science. Neuroscience seems to be having a hard time explaining consciousness. Evolutionary biology seems to be having a hard time explaining morality. And in both cases, that pushes you back to God, or your character back to God as the thing which is going to maybe provide that explanation. I think we can argue about whether how much God helps in either case. But I also have the sense that you see them as kind of two aspects of the same problem, whereas I might be inclined to say, okay, there's two different problems, both of them, very hard here. And I think so this is one way to get at the question of what is the link between, say, consciousness and morality. I'd be inclined to think there could be a highly conscious being who's nonetheless completely immoral, you know, the pure hedonist who pursues their own pleasure um, over everything else in, uh, in the world. And uh, I take it they'd be, they could be as conscious in some sense as anyone, but enormously self-centered and enormously immoral. Yeah, but that's not a contradiction. You can be, you can decide to be hedonistic or, or, um, you know, self-denying. Um, but you're still, as it were, operating out of something that we recognize as being a choice of some kind. And what, uh, what I'm saying uh, is that it's probably not a good thing if people who are out for themselves believe that they are justified by biology. Uh, you know, this is the thing about there being no Archimedean, Archimedean place to stand. You, you, we, just simply as social animals uh, who have to make a go of things together as best we can, um, we need to have some, as it were, validity to what we promulgate as desirable attitudes and behaviors. Now, and you think God validates us? I, look, oh, listen, that is so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Just a Socratic uh, question, Tom. No, it's, um, you know, uh, this, this play contains the sentence, it's tortoises all the way down. And this is how I feel about that question. Um, it isn't, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's a fair question. Um, I think that si since, you, since you brought it up, uh, you polled a lot of philosophy departments, a lot of them, uh, on a number of questions. Um, this is so great, Blanca told me about this, the only little bookshop in Philadelphia, and I was there, Fox's bookshop, I and, I, and I see this book, and it's um, a book of Royal, Royal Society lectures, isn't it? Um, and, and you're there, uh, and I was reading this this morning, it wasn't about what we're talking about, really, but there was this one thing in it which I was, thought was incredible, really interesting, which is that um, David polled a lot of philosoph philosoph philosophical departments on about 30 questions, and one of them was, as it were, atheism stroke theism. And I, I have been kind of talking to the actors and people here as though the theists were this tiny fraction of people who work in science and philosophy and so on. And it turned out that 
the atheists were 75%, not, as I would have thought, 98.8, you know. Did that surprise you? There were a lot of philosophy departments in Catholic universities and colleges. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, it, it, it didn't surprise me. Actually, I was surprised the number of atheists was quite as high were you? as it was. I certainly would have expected a majority, but, you know, 73% atheist, 13% yeah. theist, and the rest in various ways yeah. on the fence. Um, you know, there's a very big religious tradition in mm. philosophy. Many of the great philosophers of the past have been theists who oriented their philosophy around God. Now, it's certainly true that the tradition now is much more to be uh, to focus around science, but there are still a lot of philosophers who give God a very big role. Uh, the question is always, though, for, me, for, for many of us, what does God help to explain? So, you said you want God... <laughs> Might, we need something to validate us, but and the next question always is, well, you've got God there. Who validates God? What is the tortoise standing on? Yeah. If, if, God, if God decides that torture is okay, is that yeah. all right? No, I don't think that's all right. So, something, we need something else to validate God. There's also, I believe, um, Eric Sviscable, another philosopher who did polls, um, uh, I believe discovered that ethicists steal books from the library at a slightly higher rate than <laughs> other philosophers. <laughs> so, that gets back to the question, I mean, you might study and have ref deep reflective beliefs about the nature of morality and, and it might not engage your action in the way that one might have hoped, right? I um, know. Have they considered that the books on ethics may be stolen by non-ethicists? So. I don't think the study was that fine grade. Right. But. Um, uh, I'm going to be stubborn about this because it's, it's somehow my home ground in, in, in a talk which is about the hard problem in my sense and the hard problem in your sense. And, and the home ground is that um, there is something in, inadequate, disappointing about the foundation of our moral rules being ultimately the playing out of, as, as it were, a strategic self-interest, a tactical self-interest. Um, in other words, that it is a sort of empirical matter rather than a transcendental matter. And all I want to really s say about it is that it's not that I think I can demonstrate anything. I don't even actually know whether in an objective way I feel I'm right about these things. What I do think, however, is that um, <clears throat> our society, whether we're talking about big S or even in this room or family, it's just not um, worth having without unquantifiable value. And this is what my poor woman is desperate about. Uh, how do you save the appearance of unquantifiable value? We all know we're not interested in measuring value when it's quantified. You know, we, we, do, we don't care. Virginia Woolf was the tallest writer in Bloomsbury. Yeah, of course she was. But Virginia Woolf was the greatest writer in Bloomsbury. That is a totally different proposition which has no finite answer. And it's just a small fragment of a whole kind of spectrum of undemonstrable unascertainable necessary attitudes and if you like beliefs in big scare quotes is that okay with you <laughs> to, some to some people think i guess once you've quantified something you've domesticated it and maybe somehow diminished mm -hmm. it. it's not actually quite my attitude i mean i started out as a mathematician so i, I, I quite like quantifying things mm -hmm. there are people out there who are trying to quantify consciousness in some ways. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a guy, Giulio Tononi, who has this quantity phi that he thinks measures consciousness. You've got enough phi, you're conscious. So consciousness is high phi, which is mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, I think 
it's possible to develop that kind of theory of consciousness without necessarily reducing it to something it's not. So I guess I'd take a similar attitude towards morality. There'd be, there are theories of morality that, that one, one place where I think we're very sympathetic is the idea that consciousness and value are very closely connected. I think that consciousness probably serves as a source of value, maybe the fundamental source and ground of yeah. value in this world. Without consciousness, there would be no value. You know, if we were all unconscious zombies, then kill us or don't. It wouldn't make any moral difference. So it's the fact that we're conscious that grounds value and morality in the first place. But once it's there, I'm not averse necessarily to quantifying it. You know, the great utilitarian said, um, you know, what we ought to be doing is maximizing the amount of happiness with our, uh, in our actions and minimizing the amount of suffering. Now, happiness and suffering are in, at least can be regarded as states of consciousness. And if you like, you could see all that as using a measure of consciousness to quantify measures of value mm -hmm. and ultimately measures of morality. Now, I don't know, maybe you would find that diminishing or not doing justice to the richness of no, morality, I but I think that would at least utilitarianism, this is a system that says maximize happiness in everyone, not just in me, so it would support altruism, it's opposed to selfishness. And actually, David, um, you obviously believe that the brain causes consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, if, just if, if that happened not to be the case, and what was occurring in front of your eyes was that the, the brain was registering consciousness, was as it were that the arrow had been reversed, um, would that spoil the picture for you? Well, the one thing we can all agree on, I think, is there are at least causal links or correlation between the brain and consciousness. You know, I'll give you a few drinks, Tom, it'll affect your brain, and if all goes well, it'll affect your consciousness. No, it'll um, affect my behavior. My experience is a few drinks affect my consciousness quite robustly as well. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe you Brits are more robust than us Aussies. <laughs> but, um, you know, I give you certain drugs no, to no, knock you no, out. They I will affect your consciousness. So, so affect the brain. mushrooms would expand your consciousness. Yeah. You know, right. <laughs> okay. so, uh, Phineas Gage got the hammer. Uh, uh, yeah. Tool went yeah. through his head. It seriously affect, yeah. affected his consciousness. Right. And the standard sure. line is that at the very least, brain processes cause consciousness, but I'm not averse to thinking about it necessarily being the other way around. And if you go for the idea that there's consciousness evolved, involved at the basic level of every mm. physical process, which is something mm. I at least take seriously, then in a way the whole physical world will be constituted at some bottom level by tiny little amounts mm. of consciousness. And included mm. in those bits of the physical world will be my brain. My brain will be constituted somehow by little bits of consciousness in there that somehow add up to my Consciousness. Now, nobody knows how this happens, and so this, it's not as if this view suddenly solves the problem. How on earth would all those little bits of consciousness in my brain give a conscious experience like mine? But I think we should at least take seriously the idea that maybe consciousness comes first, and then it somehow organizes uh, yeah, itself I, in a certain way yeah. into physical processes. Yes, I was being provocative, but yes, we should take that very seriously. The, <laughs> um, if it's all right with you. At this point, I think we should move to questions from the um, audience. Um, it, let me remind you, there are two microphones, which I can dimly see over here. So there's one there and one there. Uh, if you're interested in asking a question, if you could uh, 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 cozy on up, if you could uh, make your way to the microphones, that would be great. I realize it may take a little bit of time. Um, Ooh. No, I'm just, I'm just going to wait a second. You've made it. Yes. Consciously, no doubt. Hello. Uh, I have two uh, favorite Zen koans or, or pronunciamentos that give me sustenance. And I'd like to share them with you and, and perhaps you could comment on them relevant to the discussion this evening. And one of these is, form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. The second one is, 
If you understand, things are just as they are. If you don't understand, things are just as they are. <laughs> if you understand, things are just as they are. If you don't understand, things are just as they are. Well, I have absolutely no problem with that second one. Um, <laughs> the first one's interesting. Empt emptiness is form. And form is emptiness. And do you know the work of Rachel Whiteread, the sculptor? There's a sculptor who does that. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I, I don't actually get... I don't get anything precise from the formulation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the second one follows from a more general principle, which is uh, things are just as they are. <laughs> but, I mean, maybe the crucial question is whether things are just as they were. Sometimes when you come to understand, things are not just as they were. Because you understand now. <laughs> one, one thing that yeah. I'm going to unfairly use this as an opportunity to uh, ask a bit of a question that... Um, that I was tempted to ask before, which is, um, I mean, so one thing that's suggested by both of these things is, uh, these questions is, might there be something about understanding, uh, sort of how we get a feel for, how we hook up to a phenomenon that goes beyond having, you know, just the fundamental laws, it has something to do with, you know, getting it. Um, and you might think that that's something that, uh, you know, the reality is there, with, with or without you. The question is, can you find the right engagement with it? Um, and you might think that, um, so what I was curious about was sort of, you might think a scientific way of sort of getting it is different from an art, sort of artistic mode. Um, and that there might be, you know, so what's the difference between you grappling with the hard problem and you grappling with well, the hard problem. Very um, little, qua philosopher and qua, yeah. uh, you know, artist. Yeah, both. I mean, I would have thought that that uh, philosophers and artists are very close together. Philosophers, artists, on the one hand, and um, physicists, perhaps, mm -hmm. on the other, probably less close. I mean, you know, th this. I don't, I don't know how it is with philosophers, really and truly, um, but I do know that writing, in, in, in the sense of the writing, kind of writing which I do myself, um, it is not a mechanistic process. You can't find it in that way. I don't monopolize the time. There's this wonderful thing Belinsky, the Russian critic, 19th century. Uh, he was a wonderful critic. He couldn't, he wrote a terrible play. <laughs> um, and he said, I, I, you know, he said, I'm not an artist, I'm not a poet. Uh, do you know this thing? Do you know this? It's, it's just wonderful. He said, um, uh, you, you can watch a poet sitting at his desk with the pen in his hand and he pauses, um, and after that pause, then the pen moves again. And he's saying, w where did he go in that moment? And it's a very good question, because you kind of go somewhere, and obviously, it's the subconscious that you go to. But you're not, as it were, in charge of what you find. And I think if I were writing philosophy, which I'd very much like to be able to do, something like that would happen in the thought processes, I believe. Yeah, you're very much, I think, either when you're writing philosophy or I take it when writing fiction, and somehow in the grip and uh, in the service of your, your muses, you have mm. to, those ideas have to come from somewhere. And it's like, hey, I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> give, yeah. me a, give me another one. But we're also both, I think, in the business of telling stories, it's just a, you guys do it a whole lot better. <laughs> we do this, the stories are a whole lot more interesting, but in a way they're both, uh, both fiction and philosophy is very engaged with the process of narrative thought experiments, come up with a scenario, 
and, uh, and think about it and think about what follows. And your play is really one thought experiment here after, after another. The emphasis is in different places and in philosophy, the setup might be a paragraph and then we'll reason and argue about it for, a, uh, for, uh, for, for pages or for, uh, or for a whole book. Whereas in, in fiction, I think it, the, uh, the narrative and the argument are much more intertwined, but really mm -hmm. it's, uh, in philosophy, the arguments might be more explicit Whereas in, in fiction, they might be more, more implicit. But, I, but when I read a lot, of, um, a lot of fiction, including yours, also many science fiction authors are wonderful at this. I kind of find philosophy really throughout. Let me turn to uh, next question. I had a question for Dr. Chalmers. Um, do you see any practical applications for solving the hard problem? Because I, I see the easy problem, it, there would be some easy applications. You could see a pathway, you could fix it if they have psychosis or something like that. But if you were to solve the hard problem, um, what, what do you see as something that would benefit like objectively for society that we, we would definitely have to see as uh, something that we want it for? Well, just say we had those fundamental laws of, uh, of consciousness that said, you know, when you have a certain brain process, then you have a certain state of consciousness. We could actually then apply that to just say we knew enough about any given brain, we could somehow predict and know the state of consciousness associated with that. So this connects to something, for example, in clinical practice right now that people are just beginning to think about. Patients who have been diagnosed with vegetative state coming out of a coma, and we just don't know some of the time whether they might be, is there any consciousness on the inside or not? Nothing that's revealed in their behavior. But we know there can be phenomena such as locked-in syndrome where there's a lot going on on the inside and very little going on on the outside. I mean, some of the classic cases, many of you all know the case in the book and movie, The Diving Bell and The Butterfly, where the guy communicated with his eyelids. But I wonder, well, what happened if there was someone like that who couldn't move the eyelids? Then we just wouldn't have a, have a sign. So people are now beginning to use brain scans to at least come to some kind of conclusions about what one might be going on. But once we had that fundamental theory, of consciousness. We might be able to use this in principle to know everything about a person's state of consciousness and even to communicate. Of course, as with all practical applications, it could be used both for good and for evil. I mean, I was once invited to give a talk about this stuff at the Central Intelligence Agency, <laughs> the CIA, and you, you can see why, you can, it's not too hard to see why they might have a pretty serious interest in, uh, in this kind of stuff. Might save them a lot of trouble with waterboarding. <laughs> 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 Uh, all right, next. I first have a comment about the history of consciousness and then a question for David. Um, you, you mentioned that um, consciousness wasn't really a concept in ancient philosophy, but what they had in a lot of the similar um, function, you know, that is defined, I, actually, I read your conscious mind book, um, uh, the word they used was life. So they were concerned mm -hmm. about, you know, well, how does, you know, how does life happen? And, uh, you know, how, how does it extend down to plants? And, you know, they talk about heliotropism and, you know, and having some sort of what we would call consciousness, but, you know, they would call a life principle that for, um, for Plotinus, for instance, you know, it, it actually, you know, that life principle comes from the soul. So it's a type of uh, panpsychism. Uh, that goes down to at least to the plant level. Um, <clears throat> that's just a comment about that. Um, the other is um, concerning uh, concerning your own work. Uh, you define in in that book. Um, you define con uh, the problem of consciousness. You clarify it, but you also take a position. And it's been a few years, but uh, from what I remember, you know, you call yourself a natural dualist. So you take a, a type of, uh, or you consider yourself a type of uh, dualist, a mind-body dualist, uh, that uh, these, it's not uh, like one, you know, er, uh, things aren't reductive to, to the brain states, you know, consciousness mm -hmm. isn't just reductive. Um, so my question is, you know, do you see um, any moral implications of taking that position versus taking another position on the problem of consciousness. You know, does it, is there any particular moral positions that uh, can emerge from that? Boy, that's a, a great question, and I don't know the answer <laughs> to it. Um, you know, I'm inclined to think that consciousness is 
the source of all value, as I meant. And I think views where consciousness is not reducible to physical processes are at least very much consistent uh, with that view and suggestive of that view. If consciousness is just another physical process, then it becomes much more continuous with the rest of the natural world. And you might want to then be inclined to look for a view where the, sort, the grounds of morality are much more uh, natural or reducible. So that's, a, uh, that's one implication. But implications for substantive moral theories, would it favor, for example, as far as I can tell, dualism is consistent with, say, the, the hedonist view that I mentioned, where we should all just maximize our own pleasure. It's consistent with a utilitarian view where we should be maximizing everyone's happiness. And it's consistent with, uh, with many other views. So I'd have to think about positive directions that might go. But Tom, on the other hand, one of his characters comes out in the play as a Cartesian dualist, is threatened with uh, losing her job around now. But it's very clear that this is, this is partly because it seems to have moral implications mm -hmm. for her. So do you have a sense? Yeah, she, um, <clears throat> she does, uh, he, she's, as it were, accused of coming out as a Cartesian dualist. Uh, <laughs> it's not a reputable position, for probably, in the modern university or any kind of academic environment. Um, yeah, um, th this is, takes us back to what she was saying about undemonstrability. Um, but I think that and it's interesting just at, at what you two were going on with. Uh, can you actually act unkindly to some person who is without consciousness? Can you, you know, is it, is it intelligible? Without, I mean, someone who's asleep, certainly, someone who's in a coma, certainly, someone who never has the capacity for consciousness? Well, Liz, uh, like many philosophers, has found it helpful, perhaps, to conjure up the idea of the zombie, who is kind of like indistinguishable from us, except it so happens in this <coughs> hypothesis, it has no consciousness. And so if you actually hacked off one of its legs, is that an unkind action still? I once did some, some polls on this, actually, some surveys. And I surveyed, I surveyed philosophers. It's one of these cases where a trolley is going down a track. And on one side, there is, a, there is one conscious being. Yeah. And on the other side, there's five zombies. Yeah. Which way do you go? Yeah. Most people said, kill the zombies. Save the, uh, yeah. save the conscious being. Yeah. And I pressed it a bit further. Yeah. About one, on this side, one conscious chicken. Right. And on the other side, a whole planet of humanoid zombies right. without consciousness. At least one, uh, the, the intuition started to split, but at least a couple of people were like, kill the meat. If, <laughs> if, they're, if they're not conscious, they're just meat. Right. So, uh, uh, at some level, I've got that intuition, that consciousness is the ground of, consciousness is what grabs and demands our moral respect. Would you pull the lever if it was David Parfit on the railway line. <laughs> Is he conscious? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, one thing that might be um, useful to sort of pull apart here is, I mean, if, that the chicken might help to pull apart, um, is you might be thinking that um, there, are, there are, in fact, creatures that <clears throat> have Consciousness, they have feeling, you know, pain, um, maybe other kinds of richer pain, pleasure, other kinds of uh, conscious, consciousness in that sense, qualia, um, but who lack agency in the sense of having a body of desires and goals that they are there to somehow, at least somewhat distinctive to them, and that they would like to pursue. Um, uh, that might be so, so. Would it be okay to kill um, the the sentient non-agent? Um, might be another way of asking the a, you know, a, a, a more refined question. Uh, it depends on. In the fact, you know, do we do so much of the time when we have our stake? And uh, I, 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 you know, if, if he if he caught me in the wrong mood, I think you know. I mean, it depends on my consciousness then. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the thing is, if I may say so, uh, 
are we any nearer to being told whether, whether we're any nearer to solving the hard problem in your context? Are we, are, are we getting any closer? Put it another way. Let's say that there's going to be a pretty much complete understanding of consciousness, that how the brain is conscious. Do you think that we might be 10 years away or 50 <laughs> years away? Or what do you actually think about yeah, that? Well, the, problem, the problem is hard. <laughs> and uh, progress is slow on, uh, on hard problems. So yeah, the last 20 to 25 years, there's been a lot of progress on the easy problems of behavior. Also a lot of progress on the correlations. And that's been really great to see the scientists actually coming back to consciousness even at the level of correlation. There are a few theories of the hard problem itself, explanations, but uh, potential explanations of consciousness, but I'd say it's pretty clearly early days. So I don't think it's gonna happen in 10 or 20 years. If it happened in 50 years, I'd be pleased, but a little bit surprised. It'd be great if it happens in 100 years, and it wouldn't totally, uh, wouldn't totally surprise me if in 200 years we've got a complete theory of the brain, and all the stuff it's doing, and people are still arguing about, how on earth does that explain consciousness? I hope that doesn't happen. I think it's entirely possible that we'll get there sooner, but I think that's the kind of time frame we're talking about, quite possibly a, a century or two. And you know you were talking about the psi number, that if you score a certain amount, you're that conscious, and yeah. if you score more, you're even more conscious. Um, is, is, there, is there actually a frontier acknowledged between, I don't know what, to, what example to suggest, you know, I don't know, um, um, uh, an oyster or something. I mean, is there, is there a frontier between the natural being, creature, which is conscious and the one which is not conscious? If there is, then nobody knows where, where it is. I mean, some people want to put the boundary at humans and humans only, but that view is increasingly unpopular. Most people are willing to say that you know, apes, probably dogs and cats and mice and quite a few mammals have subjective experience. And many people are willing to go down further. There is a big debate about fish. I see is the that? odd academic article on whether fish really feel pain. And if so, what difference that should make to our, uh, to our practices. But I think there is a grad, I think it's very hard to settle that question, but I think there's a gradual groundswell in favor of a uh, fish being, uh, being, being conscious. And I think, you know, it's gradually, it's like there's an expanding circle here. And there are certainly people who take seriously the idea that consciousness goes all the way down to the, uh, to the bottom level. This does actually kind of connect with our moral practices. I used to think that I shouldn't eat anything that was conscious or could be conscious. But if you, the more things you start attributing consciousness to, then you start get, you know, you're gonna go hungry. Uh, um, some people think plants are conscious, so. Uh, the fact is, yes, yeah, it's, it's a wide open question right now. And we need some, what we'd love to have is the consciousness meter. We could just wave at, uh, at the fish and see what's in its consciousness. Or I could wave at you and see what's in your consciousness uh, right now. But because consciousness seems to be so inherently private and subjective, all we have is indirect ways of getting at it. And, and, and don't you think that the word consciousness is a kind of failure of vocabulary that we it's really a horrible word, by the way, consciousness. I often thought, thought we had something short and snappy. Well, it's not so much that as the fact that it seems to take in forms of, not degrees of consciousness, but forms of consciousness which are very far apart from each other. And I find that conversations suddenly have gone somewhere else because we only have the one word for this thing. And I'm not very interested, not philosophically interested, in chasing down the cause of, you know, wh why you feel pain if I stabbed you with a pin. That, that's not actually that interesting. It's much more interesting to wonder what kind of consciousness would cause you to write a poem about that experience? 
or to make a painting. This is of maybe a difference between us, actually. I, it comes back to something in your, in your play where uh, one of the characters, Hillary, says to the other, explain consciousness. And, and I can't remember, one of them puts the other one's ha finger to a He's going to misquote me. I and the guy see says, <laughs> <laughs> what does the guy, you, what's the guy's line? He finger. puts, she says, he gets irritated with her, brain. and he grabs her finger and puts it in the, the scented candle by the bed. And he says, flame, finger, brain, brain, finger, ouch, consciousness. <laughs> and then she goes on and says, oh, okay, you did pain, but now explain sorrow. Yeah. What I would have said if I'd been there in her shoes was, no, you haven't explained pain. You haven't done a thing to explain pain, the subjective experience. Maybe you've explained ouch, the reaction. But ouch is the easy problem. Yeah, that's Conscious pain, the feeling of pain, that's the hard problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's so good. I'd, I'd say the hard problem is right there. <laughs> yeah. But I think this gets to the idea that for you, the problem that's really gripping you is, as Liz was saying, the, the point where it connects to morality. And somehow, and, and, to, yes. and to art, and to literature, and to value. Yeah, yes. And maybe that's why sorrow Thank is you. Thank you. Value. Value. Yeah. So the hard problem for you is the problem of value. It's the problem of value. Thank you very much. That is what it is. Let me unfairly uh, insert myself into the question, um, so because it somewhat follows up on this. So um, there. So I think a lot of what's animating Hillary and other people in the play is <clears throat> concerned with sort of what's distinctively human. Mm -hmm. and this connects to the discussion we've just been having about, you know, uh, continuity. <clears throat> and so I'm wondering what you, and as Dave said, there's, you know, increasingly people find, you know, studies focused, it, it do empirical work suggesting that other animals are rich in ways that, you know, we might not once have thought. So I'm thinking in particular about, um, uh, studies suggesting that chimpanzees, for instance, if they're playing the ultimatum game where they have to dole out money to other chimpanzees, um, will so the recipient chimpanzees will reject offers that they see as too unfair. And so those are very question-begging ways of putting the terms. But there are, if the, the partitioning is um, uh, more like uh, nine raisins to one raisin uh, in favor of the, the person giving out the raisins, then there's sort of uh, a chimpanzees, the recipient chimpanzees will hiss and, uh, you know, sort of claw and sort of not be happy, and then will later reject it in reiteration. Does that suggest some, anything to you about moral outrage or feelings of morality or fairness or value in the non-human realm? It doesn't, actually. Good. Why? No. Uh, not because they're chimpanzees, but because that behavior is related to appetite. Uh, it's not, it doesn't seem to be related to a kind of conceptual um, idea of, uh, of quantity except the way you count raisins. It's not actually a value. Um, no. Um, because, <clears throat> you know, there is a distinction, isn't there, between sorrow and pain. Uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying, that, that the, the sharp experience you have when your finger is burned, there's, a, there's an experience which is no more explained than any other form of consciousness. At the same time, um, uh, the correlation is visible between the physical brain and the experience. There is, you could actually isolate which tiny part of the brain is responsible for sending that signal to what you, where you, so you think it's your finger. Um, that's fair enough, but the thing about sorrow and many other emotions, uh, you know, including um, the, the decisions somebody might make to sacrifice mm -hmm. themselves for some cause. Uh, you ask yourself, could you actually, can you really and truly isolate where that happened um, up here? You know, so 
it just seems, as it were, a categorical difference um, when you think of emotion as opposed to experience, physical experience. And you think that not just that it's going to be involved more of the brain, involved, it seems, I mean, what makes you think that it's a categorical difference as opposed to a less pinpointed uh, phenomenon? Well, I could, I could go into that, but I'm really much more struck by the, uh, the reflex, uh, the, you know, your reflex, which is that there is nothing I could come up with which you wouldn't be able to enfold in your idea of the sameness between pain and sorrow. I mean, I could come up with incredible things, but you, your starting point would still be to say, uh, it's the same thing, it's just it's hidden, it's more hidden. It takes, more a, bit, it. takes a bit of working out, but it's the same. One, if, one relevant question, question is, do you think morality and sorrow are distinct of the human? Is this sort of coming no. out of the realm of the human? No, it's interesting. Um, my, the picture which instantly came to my mind is of the grieving ape. I don't know where it came from, but I know that apes grieve. Uh, I would not subject the ape to my massive condescension by saying that's not sorrow. Uh, it is something, it is something. Um, and it's sentient as well as, well, I think we'd have to say sentient includes the brain. Um, but I don't think that, um, you know, when you pick a daisy, the next daisy is thinking. Just a tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny bit, yeah. um, All right, let's go back to another question over here. Uh, Tom, um, all playwrights are storytellers, but my experience is that you particularly are a philosopher. Um, my question, of course, is about consciousness. We've been talking all evening about consciousness. But I'm not sure if maybe I missed something. Have we defined consciousness? And along those lines, David, you in particular, have been using the phrase states of consciousness, or levels of consciousness, when we talk about different biological organisms. I use the term states of consciousness, too, but I'm not sure what I'm saying when I use it. Have we defined consciousness? Well, it, 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 you know, it depends how difficult you want to make life for yourself. You can <laughs> simply say, I mean, you know, John Searle's definition is fair enough. Um, but that John. there's a guy Searle. called John Searle. Okay. He basically says consciousness is what you feel when you're awake. Um, it's from from. And it, it might include uh, the state of your dream, but essentially, its consciousness is what's happening to you between getting up and going to sleep. There's uh, a closely related version of this which I prefer, which is consciousness, that annoying time between naps. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was that sounds time. rather feline to me. <laughs> Um, how else could you, you know, you, w w one would never get into the meat of a, an argument if one had to really establish definitions uh, before you could proceed. Um, but it's, it's clear that um, that it's, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to go back to something you said. You know, it, it, it is true and self-evident that uh, I, at this moment, but David, when he was speaking, is aware of his own first-person subjective movie life inside his skull, and that everybody else is he has to take on trust. It's just by repute. And that is simply, that, that is just rephrasing the problem. You know, 
That is the problem. Um, how can you get hold of it in a way where you can say, oh yes, you are conscious. You know, for the first time, say, I can objectively state that uh, I know you are conscious. I have figured out that you are conscious. We're nowhere near that, are we? No. And this is, um, really these two problems are related. Yours is the problem of definition and yours is the problem of measurement. Uh -huh. And they're both two places where, you know, you might think if we had a good measurement, we'd also be able to use it to give an operational definition. But in fact, what we do most of the time for consciousness, we've got one thing that we take as the gold standard for consciousness, and that's what people say. If someone says, I'm feeling pain right now, or I'm seeing the red cross in the middle of the screen, or I'm feeling anger, then other things being equal, we take their word for it. And, and we say, okay, that's a pretty good evidence that they're conscious. Obviously, there are some troubles with this. It doesn't apply to non-verbal creatures, non-human animals, and uh, infants, and people in vegetative state, and so on. But at least what we can use in the relatively easy cases. Even that, though, I think would probably fall short of a definition. It's not that we think that to, give a, to be conscious is to give a verbal report. Probably, you know, a, a baby can be conscious without a verbal report, and uh, maybe a computer could give a report without being conscious. So the problem, even if we did have a good measurement for consciousness, the question of what it is, the definition. I mean, I think my own view is that consciousness is somehow so primitive that we may ne never be able to give a perfect definition. We can just give kind of clarifications of what we're talking about. I really like my colleague, uh, Tom Nagel um, at NYU, who was quite clearly a big influence on Tom's play. In, 19, in the 1970s, he wrote an article called, What is it like to be a bat? It's one way to raise this question of consciousness. What is a bat's consciousness like? And many philosophers, including me, adopt that in a way as their working definition. A system is conscious if there's something it's like to be that system. So there's something it's like to be me, I'm conscious. Presumably, there's nothing it's like to be this bottle. If so, it's not conscious. And likewise, a conscious state. When I'm seeing you right now, there's something it's like for me to see you. If that's right, then that state is a, a conscious state, whereas there are other states of mind, like what might be going on deep in you know, my arteries or something, which are not. There's nothing it's like to be in those states, so those are not conscious states. That's the best I can do, at least, when it comes to definition. Thank you. OK, we're going to have time for, I think, two more questions, something like that. Uh, so. So part of the reason that I'm enjoying uh, listening to the two of you this evening is that you seem to be very happily playing in the sandpit between philosophy, art, and science. Um, while remaining in that sandpit, I wonder if the two of you might offer some insight into how we might measure personal meaning. <laughs> Liz? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, no, Tom? <laughs> I mean, I do think that this Did is meaning? Um, personal meaning. Personal so what meaning. is the, I mean, I do think that um, just for me, if that's, if I were locating the nexus of uh, sort of moral gravity, um, it would be something more in that ballpark uh, than either uh, qualia, you know, if, uh, what it's like, or um, cognition of the universe's rule book, which is somehow, you know, what you might think you get from, um, you know, a kind of God's law or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. It would be something like felt agency, what matters to me, what I really care about articulating, preserving. And um, so that's a gesture at something like meaning and why it would be connected up to value. I'm not positive, and this is actually related to a question I was just thinking about as you were, the two of you were talking, I'm not positive that that um, directly, uh, its relationship to consciousness I think is complicated uh, because I think I often find myself with, I only belatedly become aware of commitments and desires and uh, motivations and you know, meanings. Um, after they've been working on me uh, and through me. Uh, and they're part of, they're what make me me, and they're what, a lot of what motivate me, but they're not always fully conscious. 
So uh, does that, to me, they don't seem like they're always fully conscious. So I guess among these definitions of consciousness, where does that kind of, does that fit in? Is that sort of continuous or is it at the margin? And that, so, and how does that connect to value? Well, the question is, you know, I, th I think the question was, uh, how does one measure personal meaning? Was it? Well, Quite how, how, how might one measure personal meaning in yeah. the context of consciousness? Yeah. Um, so, and you're thinking there, um, not just sort of, like, whether this, you know, the way in which this property or this feature or something matters to a particular agent uh, and might not matter, the very same experience in some sense of the very same experience might not matter to a different agent in the same way. Yes. See, I, I think consciousness is a given. None of these questions have any meaning without consciousness being the given. In, in the case of that question, uh, I, would, I, I would say that there is no, uh, there's almost no meaning in measuring one's meaning autonomously. I, I wouldn't care about measuring my personal meaning in isolation. My personal meaning, uh, in the end, is a measurement of how I affect the other people in my life the people I love particularly, but every axis towards another human being. Then you might begin to get a sense of how it might be possible to measure the effect of your own meaning. But taking one's own meaning as though it were some kind of temperature one might take, no, it doesn't seem e even a, a meaningful action. I, there's, so I think that there are two people left to ask questions, and I think if we're brisk, we might be able to do that. So if, can you, I don't know if you have a brisk type question. But. I, would, I think I can uh, briskly um, make a comment to Mr. Chalmers and ask Mr. Stoppard a question. It's rather That's unfair. two <laughs> things smuggled in. And what I wanted to say was I think that the utilitarians somewhat glibly promise to measure happiness um, and solve the problem that way, but they would have to be measuring goodness, too, measuring how good it was to maximize happiness. So it seems like just measuring happiness isn't, isn't enough. Now I'm moving on to my question for Mr. Stoppard. Um, about uh, evolutionary theory and meaning, I'm wondering, this is a philosophical question or maybe a, a story question, but how about the idea or the story that all our capacities and perceptions have evolved and there's no other way to explain them than through evolution, if we accept the theory of evolution, but that just as we've evolved a sense of sight and hearing and these various sensory perceptions, uh, human beings have evolved in addition a, and a capability to make moral perceptions which correspond to value, to objective value. So just the way ticks, you know, ticks evidently don't have a lot of perception, they just sense warmth and then they jump, they fall onto it, they feel warm below and suck its blood and that warmth is connecting them with something in the real world and, and then dogs can do more than that. and. Um, birds can do certain things, and then, and then human beings have evolved and a uh, perception of value, of objective value. And it seems like okay. that would There's be, that doesn't answer a lot yeah. of questions, but it would be a place to start. Uh, it's not you, it's me, but um, I'm half deaf, so you have to paraphrase a little bit. So I would say... I heard much of what you um, said. So, uh, Sometimes, I'm just going to sort of freely riff on what I think was the, I mean, I, yeah. So um, at various points in, in the play, it seems like if the worry, there's a worry that if we um, offer an evolutionary explanation of why we respond in certain kinds of ways, then that is, that explains what the thing being sensed is. Right, and sometimes captures. So, if we are evolved to respond in, you know, uh, certain kinds mm. of interactive patterns, mm. 
then that would be a s amount to a scientific claim about what morality is, right? Yes, yeah, but so. doesn't isn't it compatible to say that on the one hand we are evolved to mm. do certain things, mm. and to say that what we're evolved to do is to be sensitive to features which are really out there in the world? So just as the tick is sensitive to features which are really out there in the world. Uh, and following those is good for the, you know, being sensitive to those is good for the tick. So too, we could have evolved to be sensitive to features of objective morality, uh, and that could be good for us, but it wouldn't amount to a theory of what goodness was. Well, you know, that thank you, both of you, because that actually is very much my view. I'm, I must make it clear that, obviously, uh, I think that Darwin had the pretty much the best idea anybody ever had. Um, uh, evolution by natural selection, absolutely. Um, and the, the, the follow through or the follow on from that is something which I think, you know, one just, in the end, one has to accept that um, there's something true about our sense of morality but that's how it has been de uh, defined by the way we've evolved. For the moment, uh, you know, who has a better answer that, that, that is communicable? Um, of course, that's the case. Uh, I, I think that arguing against almost anything um, is actually quite a a useful thing to do. I think it takes you, it takes your brain to places you'd be too lazy to get to if you weren't pulling up an argument. So, so sorry, I'm, I have nothing aphoristic to say except that I, <laughs> I, I sense that you'd got the right end of the stick there, yeah. Dave, is it okay if I take this one? Sure. No. Last question for Dr. Chalmers, and uh, picking up on what Tom said about the Archimedean stance, I love that phrase, and the Darwinian, the Darwin's idea, and um, the, my question is, there's a philosopher I greatly admire, uh, uh, Colin McGinn, The Mysterious Flame from 1999, and Colin McGinn is a mysterianist. He doesn't believe that our minds are capable of solving the hard problem because we are products of Darwinian evolution. And as such, our brains are the products of a limited, confined, constrained uh, evolution on the African savanna. Uh, my question for Dr. Chalmers is, isn't it premature to affirm naturalistic property dualism in light of the fact that substance monism might be true, but we don't have the capability, capacity to understand substance monism of how Brain and mind are uniformly woven together in nature. There must be some intelligible unity in nature that runs through all of nature. We evolved. Yeah, our consciousness um, evolved. Our brains evolved. I, I, think, that. You know, I think everybody ought to have some humility about the problem yes. of, uh, of consciousness. And everyone who says they've got the answer right here and it's written down on this notepad is probably wrong. Um, <laughs> T-shirts too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe in 100 years we'll have the T-shirt. Um, I, I think, at the same time, Colin McGinn's view, I think I also take that to be, to be premature. It could turn out, at the end of the day, that the problem is too hard for us and that our brains are just can't handle it. I mean, someone, said, someone once said that if the mind was so simple that we could understand it, we'd be too simple to understand the mind. <laughs> and every day, you know, anyone who's spent much time thinking about the sciences of the mind and the brain is going to have some sympathy with this, but I don't think uh, McGinn has made anything like a, in Tom's phrase, a demonstrable mm -hmm. case for, uh, for his view. I think he's laid it out as something which could turn out to be the case at the end of the day. I'm by, by nature a glass half full kind of guy. It's like, you know, so I think the situation we are right now is on the, uh, on the border. The co consciousness seems to be sort of straining just at the, uh, at the border of what's knowable. And the theory of consciousness may turn out to be within our grasp and may not be. My own view is the only way we're going to figure it out is by, uh, is by trying and by thinking about it really hard and investigating it with all of our scientific and philosophical 
and artistic tools. If it turns out at the end of, the, of that day, after thousands of years, we still don't understand it, then maybe he's right. I'd like to think that somewhere along the way we might come up with the insight. And no, I'm not going to tell you that my own particular theory, naturalistic property dualism, is the, uh, the be all and end all, and we can go home. That's more in the way of saying my own view is that you know, the most promising places to, to uh, the most promising theories to pursue right now lie in this corner of the territory. But of course, I have to concede that I could be completely wrong. It's an interim step to further to ultimate understanding. Thank you. Um, the last word? Well, I, have, I, I shouldn't have the last word on, on a question like that, but, but temperamentally, uh, I, I don't really buy that, that uh, we've evolved in a way which, will, which doesn't actually offer the possibility, the capability of our understanding ourselves. Uh, we've already arrived at understandings in all kinds of mathematical areas, particularly which were so way beyond what seemed to be possible for us to understand. I think it's a bit defeatist uh, while David is alive and well, should we say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I think on that note, we'll uh, conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're done. Thank you guys. <laughs>